Wow, teach us how to walk, huh? You know, we all, we're all had that moment when we were born, we're in cradle and in a mother's arms or a father's arms or a guardian's arms, and at some point we start to crawl about and move about, and then we start to try to stand up and remember the, uh, when the kids were little, you know, they try to hold on to the, uh, the couch there and they try and, you know, kind of pull themselves up and hold on. And then, you know, they go to like kind of turn like they were going to get moving and they kind of fall down and, and everything. And then in time, they started kind of stumbling around. And, you know, when the little ones, they start to kind of stumble around, it's, uh, it's kind of funny and, and hokey and all, and, and you laugh, and it's so cute. And eventually, they're, they're really walking. And then eventually, they start to run. And, and you know, it's, it's a walk of faith that we have. It's a walk of faith. There's to be that movement in our life and in our walk with Jesus. And it's wonderful to walk with him, isn't it? It's so good to walk with the Lord and to walk in the Lord. Now, as passionate followers of Jesus Christ and disciples of the Lord, truth and power and the Holy Spirit and victory are ours through the cross of Christ. The war has already been won. We're just playing it out, you know, really. I hope you've read the end of the book. I always like to read the end of books first. And I like to know how it ends first before I decide if I want to read the rest of the book, you know. And you know what? Those in Christ win because our victory is in the Lord. And it's already been won long ago. It's already been won and it's already been decided. That war is won, that victory achieved. But we've got to ask ourselves, am I, am I walking in the thrill of victory? I remember, I don't know, it might have been ABC Sports when I was growing up and you know, Grandpa would always have that on and everything. And, and you know, the, what was it? The thrill of victory and the uh, agony of defeat, you know? And uh, I don't want to walk in the agony of defeat. I want to walk in the thrill of victory. You know that that victory we can always have when we're with the victor. It's just, I mean, it, it's, it's common sense, you know, when you think about it, but I, I think a lot of times we don't think about it. The victory is already won. Our victory isn't in and of ourselves. Our victory is in and by and through Jesus Christ. Maybe today, maybe this week or whatever it may be, you've been noticing some defeat. Maybe you, you sense that you're defeated. Maybe, maybe some issue of, of, of sin or compromise has, has, has tripped you up in some way in your life and, and you recognize or re, are reminded perhaps of some of that defeat and yet we can always have our victory when we look to the Lord, the author and perfecter of our faith. And he calls us to live a life that is virtuous before him, a life of purity before him. Didn't we just sing this morning, purify my heart? I, th I think it was, right? Purify my heart. To have that life that is pure before him that life that is uh, holy and pleasing and acceptable to God. And we are called to be holy instruments to him. And the Thessal Thessalonians in the Thessalonican church were called to be holy just as we are called to be holy unto the Lord, to live unto him. And so let's begin here in verses 1 and 2 where it says, finally then, brethren, and by the way, um, finally here doesn't mean finally like we 
tend to think finally like it's, you know, the last couple of statements and, um, you know, he's, he's got two chapters here <laughs> to go. But really the word here in the Greek for finally uh, in this place means more so of, of a bit of a transition now to the last part of what he's talking about, not necessarily meaning that um, uh, the close is anytime soon. But finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus, that you should abound more and more, just as you received from us, how you ought to walk and to please God. You know, I, I, we want to please God, right? I mean, we want to please God. And we want to please our flesh, right? Well, the reality is, is that we do do things that please our flesh. We do. What did the Apostle Paul say? The things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. The things I, 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 I you know, I, I, the things I, I do want to do, I, I don't do. This wretched man that I am. It kind of reminds me in the, the cartoon Disney, I think it was a Disney cartoon, uh, Bugs Life, you know, and there's that big, the bug zapper. Maybe some of you people have those bug zappers, you know. And there's that bug zapper and the, and the fly or whatever. It's, it, it sees the light and it's going towards it. And the other one's like, no, don't do it. Oh, but it's beautiful. It's beautiful. You know, and, 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 and sometimes, you know, we're, we're a little zapped there by what we thought was beautiful. And it brings so much pain and all. That you should abound more and more. Just as you received from us, how you also ought to walk in to please God. They received it from those from the Apostle Paul and his ministry team and the planting of that church, that early church. You received it from us. Perhaps there are those that you have led to the Lord. I heard uh, uh, Russ, uh, uh, his uh, uh, neighbor just got led to the Lord. I, I didn't ask. I uh, I'm curious if, if Russ and Becky led him to the Lord or what happened. But, but someone, someone was used by God to lead him to the Lord. Can you imagine if that person isn't really walking the walk? Then why would that person want to change from where they are? You, you know what I'm saying? Then it goes on in verse 2 to say, For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. That yes, there are expectations in the Christian walk. It's not just some easy believism. I think the Christian church is from perhaps behind the pulpit and not behind the pulpits, done many a disservice in perhaps, maybe not intentionally, but, but bringing the the assumption to someone else as to easy believism. Just accept Jesus Christ, you know, just, just say Jesus, just say the name Jesus, and it's like poof, you know, uh, you, you know everything's, everything's different, but we're called to walk. We're called to obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll what? Come on, obey my commands, Right? Now, that doesn't mean that because uh, we have not obeyed in every single thing that we don't love God, that love is being worked out in us and perfected in us. We're moving in that direction. We're, you know, that's, and that would be one of the, the calling cards of a Christian, is moving in that direction. Do I love the Lord more than I love my flesh? We're called to deny our flesh and take up our cross and Follow him. That following him is a denial of self. Because if we don't deny ourselves, how can we follow him? Because it's all about us. We've gotten in the way. We get in the way of following him. A lot of times we want to blame other people and the annoyances that, that, you know, that they can, can, can bring in all. You know? But, but we're, we can be annoying too. The reality is, is I think the most annoying person to me is me. I get in my own way. You know, I heard somebody, I don't even remember who it was the other day, had mentioned, I'm my biggest problem. You know, you're my, one of my biggest problems. No, I'm, but, no, but, you know, the reality is, is we really are. And I think it's a good and healthy thing for us to see it and to recognize it. 
And so we deal with this thing called the flesh, and we're constantly trying to beat the flesh down, to beat our flesh down. And that's the thing. You know, how Lindsay had said the two New Testament letters here, speaking of First and uh, Second uh, Thessalonians, um, they mentioned the rapture. We'll be getting into that, uh, probably not today, probably next week, though. They mentioned the rapture, most where, uh, were both written to the same, or all of this was written here to the same people. These letters, the first and second Thessalonians, uh, he said many important insights come from the early letters. First, it's nothing short of amazing how many Christian doctrines Paul taught these people who uh, formed the church located in Thessalonica, hence the, the Thessalonians. He brought them from idol-worshiping pagans to understanding and following the major theological subjects in just four weeks. Like monumental, monumental what he did with them in four weeks. Monumental what was covered in four weeks. Absolutely incredible. Dealt with election in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, the Holy Spirit in a number of chapters, the assurance of salvation, the Trinity, conversion, the Christian walk, sanctification, the day of the Lord, the three dimensions of men's, man's nature, the resurrection, the rapture of the church, the coming apostasy, the advent of the Antichrist, the second advent of Jesus Christ, and uh, world judgment. All in four weeks. Like, just absolutely amazing what was covered. And these are only part of what Paul must have taught them, said Hal. Can you imagine today someone going to a city dominated by uh, false religion, winning many to faith in Christ, founding a church, and then communicating all of those above truths in a matter of four weeks? No wonder the Apostle Paul was concerned about his ministry there. For our gospel, it says in 1 Thessalonians, did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. So much was covered in that period of four weeks. We'll get into that more so probably next week, but it's very interesting that among those things, dealing with end times uh, events from the apostasy, from the rapture, and other things having to do with the day of the Lord, and they were all dealt with, with a new believing church. In the early church, in a new believing church, because these matters are important to us, our entire Christian walk. The Trinity, yes. The resurrection, yes. All of these things. And an understanding that the one who came is coming back. Why? So that we do not lose hope. We're very touchy-feely as a people, you know? We like what we see, we touch, we hear, we, we taste, we, we experience and all. And it can become very easy to lose track of things and the bigger picture of things. And the fact that all of these things that are really going down in the world today all point to Jesus Christ who's coming for his church. So many things we see here. It says to abound more and more. Look now. That you should abound more and more and more. As new Christians, they were a work in progress. The Roman culture was, as you know, steeped in idolatry and 
It was steeped in immorality, idolatry, these false idols, immorality and all of the, the sexual nature of, of things. I think today is steeped in idolatry and immorality. Again, very heavily. Now they, as we, were called to walk in the Spirit. To walk in the Holy Spirit. Now, as I said, as new believers, they were a work in progress, but we all know this side of being before His glorious presence, we are all a work in progress. I am. I'm a, <laughs> I could say I'm a piece of work. We're all a piece of work. We're all a work in progress. Now, those that are new in the Lord and the Thessalonians, the Thessalonians rather, in the Thessalonican church, some of their issues and, and areas of growth may be different than those that of, of, of maybe some of us that have known the Lord for a longer period of time, but still a work in progress. That's why he says, abound more and more. That there's work to be done in this Christian walk. Much work to be done, and they need to abound in this and grow in the Lord. Now, it's interesting here as well that as it says, finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort you in the Lord Jesus. It's in the Lord Jesus. It's not our word. It's God's word. You're not following us, really. You're, you're following Christ. You're called to follow Christ. The authority isn't our own authority. The authority is the authority of the Lord. They pointed to Jesus. When we talk about matters of authority, it always needs to be about the Lord. Parents, grandparents, when raising your children, when disciplining your children, and by the way, encourage them as well. Encourage them as well. I'd note in the workplace, you know, even as an adult, isn't it so much easier to receive the discipline, to receive the, the correction and all, when you know that all or most of what you're getting from your supervisor is not just correction, but that when there is a time to acknowledge something in one's behavior in the workplace, that you acknowledge that or that you've been acknowledged or as a manager that you acknowledge that in your staff, in your employees and all. With our children, you know, I, I, I've said before, back in the day when they used to hand out uh, comment cards in the workplace, most of the time people don't fill out the good things, yet the majority of the time it's a good experience. The food is usually good, the food is usually hot, the food is usually timely, the service is usually friendly, but, but because of it, most people won't fill those things out. But if there was something one time out of you know, 20 that was not right, that's the time they're going to fill something out. There's something about our human behavior where we tend to focus on those things. It's important that we focus, or rather that we uh, understand when it's time to uh, exhort, but as well when it is time to uh, give one praise, if, if you know what I mean. With children and grandchildren and raising them and disciplining them, don't make it about you. Don't make it about your authority. Make it about Christ and make it about his word. Now, in ministry at times, you know, there's times that, you know, we've had to have a, a, a coming to Jesus meeting, you know. And in having a, a coming to Jesus meeting, we, you know, kind of uh, have to correct this or, or, or correct that or whatever. But it's so important to... Make sure that you find those things that you can encourage uh, one on uh, as well. Can we make it a little warmer in here? It's just a, it's a little on the cold side. Thank you. And it says how to walk and how to please God should always be my desire as a follower and as a disciple of Christ. 
how to walk and how to please God. I can't separate pleasing God from my daily walk. It says how to walk and how to please God because they are interrelated and they are connected. Walking and pleasing God. Denying of our flesh. It's a daily walk. It's a walk of obedience. It's a walk where we are to be holy before the Lord and set apart. A life set apart unto him. Anything else is not pleasing to God. How can I be pleasing to God if I am not set apart unto God? It just, you know, it just doesn't work. I can't be pleasing to him if I'm not set apart unto him. It would be self-deceiving. And it ultimately would rip you off to think otherwise. Romans chapter 13, verses 13 through 14 it says, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, and not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord. So see, we see that if I'm, if I'm walking in revelry, drunkenness, you know, how do I walk? You know, in fact, this is just, you see some, someone who's drunk, right? How do they walk? Not well. They stumble, but that stumbling began before they ever took the drink, and the desire for that drink, there was that, that seed that they allowed to be planted in the fertile soil of the heart, and whether it be drunkenness, lewdness, lust, strife, envy, any of these things, but a drunken walk is not a very good walk. It's a stumbling walk. And all of those things will stumble a man, or stumble a woman, and many more as well. And so we can't have those things that stumble us and say that I'm going to walk with the Lord. Because it's not a walk then, it's a stumble. It gets in the way. And so what do I do? I put on the Lord Jesus. When I first came to Christ, <laughs> ooh, I had, I had a really bad mouth, you know, and uh, I wasn't a sailor, but you probably thought I was by the way I talked, you know, and, and, you know, after a while, you're just so used to talking that way. I mean, it's like, can you, can you say a complete sentence without using, you know, this, then, or, you know, whatever it might be, and, and uh, so I came to the Lord, and I'm like, oh, I, I, it just comes out, you know, what comes out, by the way, it comes out because it's what's in here, you know that, right? If something can't come out if it's not in there. Where did it come from then if it's not in there, you know? And don't we say that? Oh, and you say something, oh, excuse my French. I'm sorry, I heard that in English. Okay? That's the, that's the reality. Or, or, or we say something and it's like, oh, that, oh, I don't know where that came from. I know where that came from. That which comes out of the mouth right, or proceeds from the mouth, it begins in the heart, comes from the heart. And so I thought to myself, okay, this is what I got to do. Every time I start talking like that, I'm just going to bite my tongue and bite my lip, and I'm just going to make it so painful. And, and then before you know, I can't talk at all, because I'll do it like this, you know. And, and, but that didn't work, you know. And I thought, thought to myself, okay, anytime I do that, I, this was my love. It was ice cream. I used to eat two half gallons of ice cream every week, okay. I kid you not. And, and, um, and I thought, okay, I'll deny myself ice cream every time I do that. Oh, that didn't end up working. I still, you know, it's not about some outward fleshly way of trying to prevent myself from entering into those areas of sin. It's by putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, putting him on, allowing for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to work through every fiber of my soul. And then we see that I make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Not because I'm trying from some fleshly external way to stop doing those things. My heart might have been in the right place, but it just doesn't work. What works is I need to fill myself with him. And if I'm filled with him, I'm not filled with myself and I'm not filled with my flesh, you see? And that's the key. That truly, truly is the key.
Got some issues with that this mic today, huh? For you, a few verses that deal with our Christian walk. A few verses that deal with our Christian walk. You might remember in Romans chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also we should walk in the newness of life. That if we have that newness of life in the Lord, we ought to walk in that newness of life in the Lord. Or how about 2 Corinthians 5, 7, if you're taking notes. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Why? Because our eyes deceive us. Something can look very good. And it could be poisonous. That would happen back uh, in the day of leaders and Caesars and kings and all. That food, that beverage, it looked so good. It was appealing to the eye, but they didn't realize that there was poison that was slipped into that. It looked great, but it was deadly. Be careful that you're not deceived by your eyes. We walk by faith and not by sight. Galatians 5.16 says, so then I say, and, and I used to repeat, and Kathy used to repeat to our kids all the time. In fact, I say used to. We still do. <laughs> walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I always say, you go out the door, walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Are you walking in the Spirit? Walk in the Spirit. In fact, it says in verse 25 of the same chapter, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Ephesians 4.1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Or in Ephesians 5, 2, and walk in love. As Christ also has loved us and given himself for us as an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Now, this is an interesting one. As we're talking about Ephesians 5, 2, to walk in love as Christ loved us. How did Christ love us? How is Christ's walk demonstrated in love? Ultimately, upon the cross. And so we see love is really defined throughout God's word. True love is defined as sacrificial love. It's sacrificial. Love is an action word. It's demonstrated, and so we are called to take action in our walk of love. And we have Christ as our example before us. And as a sweet swell, smelling aroma. Christ is our example in all these matters. When we talk about a Christian walk, because we, I mean, what does a Christian walk look like? And I, I, we could, I mean, there's books on these things. There's, we could speak for weeks and do a series on, you know, uh, our Christian walk. How do I walk in Christ? We were. Born into this world, into sin, and we've learned to walk into sin. I never taught my children to disobey me, but the sinful nature produced it within them. The disobedience came natural. The obedience did not come natural. I like what Kathy says, Sinner, sinning is what sinners do. Why are you surprised, you know? I never taught my children to say no when they were toddlers. But the sinful nature and the flesh within them taught them those things. And so they learned to walk, speaking not physically, but in their life, in their lifestyle, they, or we, I should say, learned to walk or conduct ourselves in a way that was not honoring and glorifying to God because we didn't even know him to begin with. We didn't even know him. Perhaps we might have known of him, but you know that to know of him is different than to know him. Okay? Leonard Ravenhill said, smart men walked on the moon, daring men walk on the ocean floor, but wise men walk with God. Henry Ford said, those who walk with God 
always reach their destination. C.S. Lewis said to walk out of his will, I really like this one, to walk out of his will is to walk into nowhere. You feel like you're going nowhere? You're doing a lot of moving like a hamster on a wheel? I'm moving, I'm moving, but I'm not getting anywhere. That's what happens when we walk out of his will. We're still moving, there's movement going on, but we're not in his will, and so we're getting nowhere. Interesting. Or how about Edward M. Bounds, who said, walking with God down the avenue of prayer will acquire something of his likeness, and unconsciously we become witnesses to others of his beauty and his grace. Dwight L. Moody said, if I walk with the world, I can't walk with God. It goes back to the verse that we read a few minutes ago. If I walk with the world, I cannot walk with God. So true indeed. Another said, more important than starting well in our walk with God is to finish well. Is to finish. It's easy to start a project. It's much harder to finish a project. You know? We can all start something, but finishing it is another matter altogether. You know, one of the ways that you finish that project, so to speak, in our walk with the Lord, walk and don't sprint. What happens when you sprint? Eventually, you lose strength. You lose power. Your your muscles begin to, you know, maybe tighten up. You lose that that capacity within your lungs to be able to just breathe because you're just sprinting and running so, you know, so fast. You just can't keep that for the long haul. And maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm doing it in the Lord and I'm I'm, I'm all for it. I'm all in. I'm going for the gusto and all. But maybe you're sprinting and you've lost breath. And then what happens? And you don't move at all. You stand still. You're doubled over. You can barely catch your breath. You're not moving. You go from sprinting to not moving. And so I believe clearly that's the reason why it's called the walk of faith and not the sprint of faith. Because the walk shows a constant, consistent movement in our relationship with the Lord. I think that is so absolutely valuable and fundamental that we've all got to remember that. We've all got to remember that. We are exhorted, and that word to exhort means to force or impel in an indicated direction. And so when we're talking about the walk of faith, he's exhorting them in the walk of faith. He's, he's uh, 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 impelling them. He's, he's, he's trying to to paint the picture for them of there's an indicated direction that we have as Christians. Before we were Christians, we either had no direction or a wrong direction. Even the no direction is the wrong direction too, but you know what I mean. We either were were without direction or just going in the wrong direction. Here we see that the apostle is exhorting them, exhorting them in their direction towards the Lord, towards regular and consistent movement in their walk. It might be slow. It might be slow. Something about that word slow. Slow. Okay, it didn't happen that time. It might be slow, but are you walking? Are you moving in your relationship with the Lord? And then it says that we're exhorted to live this this virtue, you know, this, this pure, this undiluted life for the Lord. To not allow our sin in the flesh to dilute us. To be diluted means one thing is mixed with another. And we can't mix with the world. We can't mix with the world. It doesn't mix. Do you find or recognize that you're just rather different? I'm so different now. That's good. You weren't saved to remain 
the same. You're different. A new creation in Christ speaks of something or someone different. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. If you're taking notes, uh, verses 5 through 10. It says, But also for this very reason, reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will, by, uh, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things... Let's change this out. Let me know when it's on. So when you, it says, that if you do these things, not just if you know these things, we know lots of things, don't we? It's the doing of the things that becomes problematic. I think the enemy just doesn't want this message going out. <laughs> it's, the, it's the doing of them, not just the knowing. We know all kinds of things. Where the proof is in the pudding is when we do them. We're called to be knowers of the word of God. No, that's not what it says. It says, be ye what? Come on, doers of God's word. Otherwise, we have forgotten that we've been cleansed from our old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. Wow, that's the thing. That's the key. That's the key, to do them, to be doers of the word of God. Now, as he's continuing to exhort this new church, verse 2 says, for you know what commandment we gave you through the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 3, for this is the will of God. You ever pray that, Lord, what's your will? What's your will? What's your will in this? What's your will? What's your will? I need to know your will. I want to know your will. I want to do your will, not just know it. But sometimes he tells us his will, and they're like, oh, no, no, no. I, don't, I didn't sign up for that. No, no. Thanks for letting me know. But yeah, <laughs> you know, now that I know, okay, well, let's, I don't know. You know and then, I, I need to know. I want to know your will, and then I want to and need to do your will. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that we live a life that is holy unto God. That's his, that's his will. If, when, when, you, when you pray God's will... Know that in what you're praying, in that matter, in that situation, he wants to develop holiness in you. He wants to develop holiness in you. Lord, what is your will with that job? Well, one thing I can tell you. This I can tell you. Lord, do you even want me to have that job? What's your will with that, you know, with, with this particular, uh, you know, whatever it is with that job? Or, or what's your will with with this particular matter in my life? Well, one thing we can say, his will, is that you be holy before him, that you grow in holiness, that you walk a holy walk before the Lord in that very matter that you are praying for a clear direction on, your sanctification. And here in this issue specifically, that you should abstain from sexual immorality because it goes back to what we were saying at the beginning of this message. They were dealing 
predominantly the two major issues that they were dealing with was sexual immorality and idolatry. So sanctification, to be set apart, holy unto God. God wants to set us apart because a Christian is set apart unto God. Every aspect in our lives is to be affected. I can't say, Lord, set me apart here, but not here. Because he wants to sanctify you through and through. Every part in your life. Do you recognize that many of the issues that we go through in our lives, those, those thorns in our flesh, so to speak, are because God is wanting to do a work of sanctification. And so he allows us to go through this or that at times because that is part of the process that he is using in sanctifying us. It should affect every part of who we are. Do you ever ask what God will? Well, you know, it's a biggie. Be holy. Be holy. You know, Pastor David Guzik had said in regards to this verse, Paul gave these commands to a first century Roman culture that was marked by sexual immorality. And at this time in the Roman Empire, chastity and sexual purity were almost unknown virtues. Hmm. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? Nevertheless, Christians were to take their standards of sexual morality from God and not from the culture. They need to learn this. They needed to learn this. They needed to walk in it. We learn, and we are called to walk as well. There was an ancient writer who expressed uh, the, the generally amoral view of sex in the ancient Roman Empire. And he says, and I quote, we keep our prostitutes for pleasure. We keep mistresses for the day-to-day -day needs of the body. We keep wives for the faithful guardianship of our homes. That was the accepted morale, which was not, but you get the point. That was the accepted morale of the day. To go against that, you're a nut. Who are you? You're crazy. You're weird. You're, you're, you're different. Who are you, Christian? Who are you, they want to know. Why do you talk like this now? Why don't you talk like, like, like we talk? You talk differently. You, 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 your, your plans are different now. Your goals are different. You look at life differently. You look at life upside down because to them, this is right side up. But in reality, the life in this world, in the flesh is upside down. And through receiving Jesus Christ, he's turned us upside, or right side up. You see? And they, and they want to know, what's, you know you're, so, you're so different. It's because of Christ. He's changed my life. I'm not who I was, and praise God, I'm not who I was. I was on a collision course. I was going down to a fiery death. And Christ saved me my soul. And what he did for me, he can do and he wants to do for you, you know? But that's, that was the, the, the thought of the day. That's the thought of the day today as well. Hey, don't get married before living together first. What do they say? You got to drive it. You drive a car before you purchase it from the lot, Right? So, you know, you take each other around the block for a while. You live together, and what we know is in sin. And, and then, you, you know, you go from there, perhaps. But that's not God's way. That's not God's way. That's the way of the world. That's the way, of, the way things are in the world around us today. Sexual immorality is a plague, and it's a blight upon even the Christian church today. In fact... In 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians is dealing greatly with the issue of sexual immorality, not outside of the church, but inside the church. Things that were taking place that were even unspoken of among the heathen. So shameful that even the heathen 
by and large, would not have done such things that were being done, goodness forbid, in the church of the living God, in the Corinthian church. And it's been a, we've, we've read it before and we've addressed it. That sexual immorality is such a blight. Many Christians are living in guilt over the past or defeat over the present in regards to this issue, you know? This isn't meant to beat anybody up. Many of us have been there. And if not in that area, then in other areas. But God's word warns us of these things because he knows that those things are not going to produce really what you want in life. But the flesh can be so deceitful, you know, and the eyes can be so deceived. Eve was deceived, at least in part, by what she saw. She looked and, hey, that fruit looked good. She was deceived by her eyes instead of trusting in the Lord. And we're dealing with the repercussions of that today. But we won't always deal with the repercussions of that. Praise the Lord. 